So welcome everyone to this World Water Week session, The Heart of Resilience. Uh, we're really happy to see you here and looking forward to explore the connection between gender, worship, and climate change. Uh, the session is organized by CIMAVI, uh, WaterAid, Stockholm Environment Institute, the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, and the Center for Social Planning and Administrative Development in Kenya. My name is uh, Sandra van Sulen. I'm program manager at CIMAVI, and I will be your host for the session today. And we're looking forward to an open exchange and also hear from you in the chat box uh, and later on in breakout rooms. Uh, and we're also eagerly to share with you uh, some tools and methodologies to understand better the interlinkage between gender, wash, and climate change. Um, yeah, so before we really dive into the context, some ground rules. Uh, so please make sure you, your microphone stays on mute. Uh, for questions, please, or comments, or anything you want to share with us, please use the chat box in Petable. That's where you joined the session today. And if you have any technical issues, also please let us know, then we will do our best to solve it. Um, we also have a poll in, in the Petable platform. There are actually three questions we would like you to, to answer to know who is in the room. Uh, so you see the poll option as well on the Petable platform on the session page. And here we have three questions for you. Uh, first, uh, where are you from? Where are you calling in from? Um, secondly, what kind of organization uh, are you working for? And thirdly, be very interesting to hear. Um, yeah, how how would you describe your level of confidence on the gender wash and climate change interlinkage? So, are you maybe a bit new to the topic, or you feel you already have some more experience? Please let us know in the on the poll on Petable. Um, Great. So next up, uh, I would like to share a bit more about the program today. Uh, so uh, we'll first um, have, uh, yeah, we'll first set the scene for you to explain like why it's important to talk about this topic. Uh, then secondly, we'll have a panel discussion where we will have uh, four speakers sharing different methodologies and tools that can be used to understand uh, better, uh, yeah, what's going on on the nexus between gender, worship, and climate change, and how this can help us to yeah, use the untapped potential of women. And after that, we will go into a breakout session to really have an interactive discussion and have more time to dive into uh, the tools and methodologies. Um, and then we have a plenary closing. Uh, so that is a bit how the program looks like. Um, and then, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce Catherine Farr. Uh, she's a senior policy advisor for International Climate Action at WaterAid. And Catherine is based in London and works on climate and wash and gender issues. She has, she has over decades of experience in science policy and implementation, with a particular focus on water and climate. So Catherine, please take the virtual floor and help us to set the scene for this session. Thanks so much, Sandra. It's a real pleasure to be here today with everyone. Um, so as Sandra said, I'm going to set the scene a little bit uh, about what we mean when we talk about climate, wash, and gender. So without access to safe and sustainable water, sanitation, and hygiene, often shortened to wash, people in rural areas and cities are more exposed and less able to cope with climate hazards like droughts, floods, disease, sea level rise, and uncertain weather. The world needs to act now to protect communities from the impacts of climate change. There are so many ways that protection can happen through mitigating future risks by decreasing our carbon emissions and other emissions that are accelerating climate change, and by helping communities adapt to the impacts that have happened and to help them build resilience so they can thrive in the face of climate change. Adaptation and resilient measures are critical for these communities and they need to happen now. But without a crystal ball to know exactly what the impacts of climate change will be for each community, there is hesitancy in how to act. 
This has resulted in adaptation being underfunded as everyone looks for perfect, no regrets or low regrets solutions. In other words, solutions that have no or very few drawbacks regardless of what climate future turns out to be the reality. What would these solutions look like? What can we do that won't have big negative consequences? These are the questions policymakers want answers to, to feel empowered to act. As it happens, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has found some low regrets adaptation measures that it highlights in its February report earlier this year. One of those adaptation measures was providing water and sanitation services. This means the climate experts recognize that WASH is important for building community resilience to climate change and that working towards increasing access to WASH services is part of climate adaptation as well as the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Building community resilience means making sure to improve the situations of the most vulnerable. Climate change makes that goal harder because it exacerbates all inequalities, including gender and disabilities. Every person experiences climate change differently. Even when a group of people are facing the same climate impact, they each have their own sets of identities and vulnerabilities that determine how they experience that impact. Those identities and vulnerabilities come from many aspects of life, such as gender, age, class, and income. We cannot address adaptation measures by treating vulnerable people as a single group. Instead, we need to engage with communities, particularly vulnerable groups, to understand what they need and to create adaptation measures like WASH services that are both sustainable and responsive in the face of climate change and that are inclusive to all those who need access. This is particularly true when considering women and girls. Older women have different WASH needs than mothers of young children. Women who are pregnant and lactating need more water than usual to remain healthy. We know that women are affected when WASH services aren't accessible, but not all women are affected in the same way, so they need a range of solutions. So why are women disproportionately affected by climate change? The recent ICC, IPCC report and other research highlights several different factors to answer this question. First, Climate change will increase the prevalence of waterborne diseases such as cholera, and women are often the primary family members providing unpaid care for all who are ill. Second, when climate impacts reduce water security and hinder or obliterate wash services, again, the risk of harm increases for women and girls and others who are marginalized, such as non-binary individuals, when they have to travel further away for water collection, for drinking and hygiene, and for access toilets or latrines. When wash facilities don't exist or stop working, the risk of physical violence increases as these women have to go further to act, these people have to go further to access these resources and maybe in situations where they need to go alone. Sometimes you can't wait for your friend to go with you. Third, when places like schools and healthcare facilities and disaster shelters don't offer women and girls the safe water and sanitation facilities they need. It's a real problem. For example, some disaster shelters are a single room with shared facilities, which gives women and girls no privacy and increases their risk of gender-based violence. They can't feel safe and often won't use these facilities, which puts their health and sometimes their lives at risk. At best, for schools, they won't get the education they need to make the most of their lives. Knowing that girls and women are disproportionately affected we need to understand in what ways, how much, and where when we think of crafting the right kinds of policy responses. This often leads us to a question of data, of evidence, of proof of the problem. But much of that data, disaggregated by gender, doesn't exist. And what does exist is often simply a counting of the number of women present at an event or a meeting. This counting metric does not tell us anything about the challenges different genders face, or if women are part of real decision making, and where gender equality around WASH is happening. Additionally, normally non-binary gender data is not even collected and so cannot be part of any gender disaggregated data that does exist. When recognizing that numbers cannot tell the full story, 
we need a baseline from which we can monitor these indicators for comparison to detail the gender challenges faced and any progress made towards gender equality. It is important to monitor indicators for agency, empowerment, and participation in WASH to understand a more holistic vision of what is happening regarding WASH and gender equality. These indicators could factor in aspects such as balance of work and control over household assets across genders in the family level and at the community level. Having the right indicators, ones that don't just measure if women are in the room or theoretically have access, but that track a range of challenges and are disaggregated by gender, can not only help with monitoring, monitoring and evaluation, but the lessons from that monitoring can help us diagnose the right challenges and design interventions for her. We need inclusive processes that bring women into the heart of decision-making and give them the authority to help make decisions and to be full members of any decision-making body. We need to strike at the structural inequalities that keep women from being able to speak up and lead. One example of empowering women to solve wash and climate challenges is some work being done in a small Bangladeshi village with the support of WaterAid. A group of women were interested in working with WaterAid and another local NGO through WaterAid's Water Entrepreneurship for Women's Empowerment, or WeWe, approach. This approach centers the leadership on local women who are trained to manage and run a new drinking water treatment facility to bring safe drinking water that can also be used for hygiene to their communities that had significant salinity issues partially due to climate change. With women leading every step of the way and through the COVID pandemic to keep their community safe, it became clear to the entire village that women could and should take on new leadership roles. WaterAid has worked to create inclusive and sustainable frameworks that can be used in engaging communities and designing WASH services to ensure they meet a range of gender needs and that they are adaptive to climate change. Later this week, we'll be releasing guidance that we have worked on with Diageo and Coca-Cola to help communities and implementing NGO partners systematically embed gender equality and women's empowerment into the design of WASH projects. Our collective work on gender is not just about ensuring authentic and impactful gender equality by listening to perspectives, but also ensuring that water, wash and climate work involve gender diversity at all levels, including at decision-making and leadership levels. Every day, there are women and girls who are expected to carry heavy water jerry cans back to their homes for drinking and hygiene, or who, and or who are expected to care for ill family members. These women and girls are having to create adaptive solutions to the climate challenges they often face without any real support. And their struggles and challenges are not being shared with those trying to design the right adaptive solutions for vulnerable communities. We need to ensure these women and girls are formally engaged in identifying both challenges and resilient solutions to climate change for their communities and beyond. Their involvement in design and implementation of WASH solutions is critical. They deserve a seat at the decision-making table because they know the challenges and what it takes to build resilience. A twofold reality presents itself. While women are disproportionately affected by climate change, they are uniquely situated to lead efforts in response to it. This session aims to collect recommendations for further cultivating women's untapped potential as the heart of resilience. And so this session will focus on presenting methodologies and tools that can help with that. Back to you, Sandra. Thanks, uh, Catherine, for this valuable overview of the uh, nexus between gender, wash, and climate change. I think a very important topic to discuss today. Um, so next up, we want to yeah, better understand this nexus and also understand what different partners are already doing to understand uh, that the landscape better with their different methodologies and tools. Uh, so we're going to a panel discussion. It's for uh, experts. And uh, the moderator for the panel discussion is uh, Naomi Carrot, the research director at Institute for Sustainable Futures, a research center within the University of Technology of Sydney. And Naomi's applied research focuses on sustainable, safe, and inclusive wash. 
She has particular interest and experiences in the link between wash, gender, equality, and sustainability transformations. And Naomi works in partnership with governments, NGOs, and research, researchers in Asia and Pacific countries to realize the human rights of water and sanitation and a sustainable future for all. Her work is a mixed method, balancing being practical and idealistic. Naomi, please take the virtual floor to lead us in the panel discussion. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you, Catherine, for that really fantastic uh, welcoming presentation. And I think the phrase that really jumped out at me was that we need to find ways to strike at the structural inequalities. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from the panelists today uh, for really interesting approaches that they each are sharing um, and in ways to, to understand the inequalities that exist, engage with, with people and improve our learning so that we can then take implement approaches that do strike at those structural inequalities. And so the first speaker today is uh, Sabiha Sadiq, who works as a monitoring evaluation and learning advisor in Samabi, supporting programs in Asia and in Africa. Sabiha's work focuses on wash, gender and climate change. She's passionate about her work around research, evaluation and the human rights for water and sanitation. And one example is her work implementing the Making Rights Real approach and incorporating the human rights to water and sanitation in WASH entrepreneur activities in Bangladesh. So today, Sabiha is joining us from Kathmandu, where she's working with her team, and she'll be sharing her work researching the connections between WASH and violence against women in Nepal, Bangladesh and Uganda. So Sabiha, to, to kick off this panel discussion, are you able to share with us a bit more about your focus group discussion approach uh, when trying to address gender-based violence? How does your particular focus group discussion approach facilitate gender sensitive research? Thank you very much, Naomi, for introducing me and uh, for a very good question. It's an honor to be here today with all the panelists and thanks a lot to all the participants who joined us today. Um, to answer your question, I would like to start with a small brief about the tool um, and then we'll go um, in depth on the, on the, on the tool. Um, designing a research uh, on a topic, uh, sensitive topic like gender-based violence against a uh, woman requires more attention. Reducing the gender biases and using the gender sensitive lenses uh, while doing the key informant interviews, focus group discussion and test reviews are key to the research process. In countries like Bangladesh, Nepal and Uganda, women uh, and girls, um, as well as the stakeholders or in society in general, they do not talk openly about uh, the harassment or the violence happening in relation to while accessing to water sanitation and hygiene facilities. For example, sex torsion for the safe water, um, uh, harassment while taking a, uh, taking a bath in an open source like pond, um, or the violation of dignity that happens due to using a toilet with very fragile um, infrastructure are, are, are really uh, there, out there, but not being discussed. And the challenge around the nexus between gender, gender-based violence and um, the wash is um, invisible yet very real. Therefore, Simavi um, conducted um, a research on violence against women and girls in relation to use and access over wash resources. And in that research, we introduced this tool of um, having a workshop based uh, focus group discussion. We did this uh, three to four day long workshop to create an enabling environment for the participants to understand the concept of gender, gender-based violence and wash at first, and later open the floor for the discussion and to answer the questions uh, uh, better. You can see in the slide that um, like most of the research, we also did a desk review, transact worked in the communities and key informant interviews with the police officer, healthcare workers, local government and community people. Um, and for the FGD with the community, I, um, we conducted this workshop. And um, today I would like to focus uh, more on the how we did uh, the workshop approach within the research. So the workshop was actually, the aim of the workshop was to create a safe and enabling environment for all the participants, especially for the women and girls to talk about the harassment or violence happens on a daily basis in their lives. Um, we started uh, uh, with the conceptual clarity on what is sex, gender, gender-based violence and WASH um, because the link was not very clear to the participants initially. 
We also introduced several games um, to create a friendly environment of all the participants because there were male and female participants of different age groups. We also did group exercises to, um, for the participants to, be, um, uh, to, uh, to contribute and uh, share their opinions um, regarding these, um, uh, these topics. Um, we also involved a very um, expert, um, gender expert, who also has a facilitation um, expertise, uh, so that we can also um, have an effective uh, workshop altogether. So the facilitator um, ensured the participation of women and girls during the workshop um, throughout the time. Um, on the last day, we actually introduced um, the focus group discussion and we asked the questions in, um, in a different groups. So female had, uh, were in one group, one room and the males were in another, um, another room. Sometimes we also asked questions all together. Um, so that was the tool. We tried to be inclusive um, and um, uh, during the research work uh, so that we really have uh, open uh, open communication and also so that the woman can also share um, their experiences and um, to have a better result. So that's all uh, for now. I will um, uh, give uh, the floor back to you, Naomi. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sabiha, for sharing that example. And what really uh, strikes me from your presentation is the importance of creating safe spaces when you're trying to explore these kinds of sensitive topics. And it's not the sort of topic that you can explore with a simple survey or a, a, um, a data collection exercise uh, of that kind of nature. And so we need these innovative qualitative approaches to really get uh, to depth on these sorts of issues. So we'll move on to our second panelist now. And as we do, please do put your questions for Sabiha into the chat and we'll come back to them at the end of the initial round of introductions. But the second speaker I'd like to introduce today is Jacob Baratza. Jacob works with Samavi as a program officer focused on WASH and climate. He's joining today from Amsterdam, um, but his work focuses particularly in Kenya in Africa and in Nepal and Bangladesh in Asia. Uh, before joining Samavi, he was working for the Centre for Social Planning and Administrative Development as their Advocacy and Communications Director. Uh, Jacob's work seeks to build transparency, accountability and participation of marginalised groups in water-related decision-making processes, and he's recently been exploring interests in climate finance for WASH and digital water diplomacy for peacebuilding, both really important and fascinating areas. So today, Jacob is sharing a systems visualization approach to fostering women's participation. And the question I'd like to ask you, Jacob, to, to kick off your contribution to the panel is how can systems visualization be used to identify strategic entry points for women in climate change and wash decision-making processes? Uh, thank you very much, Naomi. Uh, first of all, I'd like to appreciate uh, the, the background that has been given by our, uh, the speakers that have talked earlier on, and we appreciate uh, the fact that WASH, uh, climate change, and gender, they are very much interlinked. And over and above that is the fact that we don't have resources, adequate resources to, to address uh, uh, climate adaptation. So as much as we are talking about uh, participation and meaningful participation for that matter. The question is, how do we make sure that women are engaging at the right time uh, through the right entry points and have the right arguments? And so to do this, uh, together with uh, CIMAVI, uh, CESPAD had to conduct a study in Kajiado and Makweni counties in Kenya, uh, where it was identified that uh, one of the challenges is that there is increased population growth due to the proximity of the counties to the capital city of Nairobi. The other thing is that uh, the, the, the two counties are uh, arid and semi-arid areas, uh, which have issues with uh, water scarcity. And also because of the behavior and uh, the norms of the people, there is a poor wash. And finally, uh, very low climate change resilience uh, practices. Over and above that, one critical element that contributes to women not being able to participate in decision-making processes is the gender patriarchal norms. For example, in Kajiado County, women are not able to talk where men are, or 
if you have less cows, then you have no voice. And remember, the cows are run by the men. So that makes uh, women participation uh, very challenging. So through the uh, castle loop, uh, we, 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 we used to identify what are the, cre the three critical entry points that uh, women can maximize on if they have to, to contribute to decision-making processes in wash and climate change. So one is through the water and sanitation uh, lens where they would uh, use their needs. Of course, we appreciate that the needs for women and the needs for men are totally different. And again, just highlighting an example, when you go to a water point in uh, Kajado County, uh, women will have to fetch water last because uh, the animals that belong to men are prioritized. So over and above the long distance, we have also the long queues and waiting for them to fetch water after, after the cows have taken as much as uh, they can. Uh, the second one is uh, through non-discrimination. And as a country, uh, Kenya has uh, a number of legislations that speak about public participation. May it be in the Public Finance Management Act, may it be in the environmental uh, space, water space, they are even including at the county level, numerous provisions for public participation. So this was also identified as another critical area to go through. However, when, when can you be more uh, effective in terms of uh, uh, your participation? And last but not least, of course, anchoring participation and uh, the key principles of good governance where we would motivate and encourage through uh, capacity strengthening women to effectively participate in the governance structures. So for more information about how uh, the details on how we identified this uh, through the SAT analysis, PESTEL, uh, we can join in in the, in the group discussions to elaborate and also just to hear experiences from the other uh, participants from other places. Uh, how this particular tool can be used to, to identify uh, the areas of entry points for women and girls in the space of climate change and wash. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. And, and it's, a, it's really great to see that approach from, from systems thinking being used as a way to figure out um, understanding the system is a way of identifying what are the key leverage points where women can contribute and where we can try to, to reach that goal of shifting social norms that you raised as so critical to enabling transformation and women's meaningful participation. And so now we're moving to a, a different tool um, in the form of a, a quantitative data, data collection and analysis tool. And I'd like to welcome to present that tool our third speaker, Piranan Tawashiraporn, uh, who works as the director of the Geospatial Information Department at the Asian Disaster Preparedness Centre in Bangkok. And um, Piranan has worked extensively on risk and vulnerability assessment, and he specialises in urban disaster risk management and catastrophe risk modelling. Uh, recently, Piranan has been interested in the topics of risk transfer and risk financing schemes for natural disasters and applications of risk modelling in wider socioeconomic contexts. His original training was in civil engineering and he's bringing that experience to the critical gender climate nexus. So today Piranan is joining us from Bangkok where his office is based and he'll be sharing his work developing a gender equality monitoring tool to collate and share data on gender inequality at sub-national levels. And so to invite your contribution to the panel, Piranan, I'd like to ask you, first of all, how will the gender equality monitoring or the GEM tool inform users and help them address gender inequality issues? Okay, thank you, Naomi, for the, for the introduction. Um, and just wanna say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone on, on, this, um, on this session. It's my pleasure to speak in this session, but I will be more um, pleased to join the conversation that, that will follow the, the presentation. So today, before we start looking at the gender, gender inequality data that I'm about to present, I want to make a reference back to the set the scene remark made by Catherine. I think she said it correctly that the impact of climate change and poor uh, wash is not gonna be felt equally to mean, be between um, men and women. So that was the starting point that brought us to the thinking of whether or not we should then start looking into where 
this gender gap and gender disparity is strongest before we even even um, uh, try to uh, manage the inequality. That led to the thinking of this gender equality monitoring tool. So I think no matter where you are, we all know that gender inequality exists in your country, in many parts of your countries. But have you ever wanted to see where the gender inequality is located and where it is strongest in your countries? and how the gender inequality progresses over time, changes over time, be it in a, in a better sense or in a worse sense. Or, I mean, have you ever wanted to compare gender inequality between two provinces in your countries? So these kind of demands were the, the, the leading point for our team to start thinking and putting on the design board, starting to develop the gender in, uh, equality monitoring tool that you were about to see. Simply put, we put gender inequality data on a map to allow users, to allow anyone to be able to see, visualize, do some simple analysis, download the data and be able to use them in the future. So just to um, go back a little bit, the tool here that you see on, on the screen is part of the program, a regional, actually is a global program led by uh, USAID and NASA. Uh, the idea behind this program is to bring data satellite data, modeling technique, and mapping technology to address real development issues and gender disparity, gender inequalities, and real issues. So uh, what we are trying to do here is to focus in a small region first, but the uh, methodology and approach that we develop here are totally uh, replicable and scalable to, to other regions. So in the remaining time that I have, I just want to quickly introduce you to the gender equality monitoring, or in short, we call it a GEM tool just to give you a glimpse of what it can do and getting you to start thinking about how you can use it in your work and replicate it in your region. So here it is about a GEM tool. Quickly, the GEM platform offers basic three functions. The first one, um, it allows you to visualize the gender inequality indices at the subnational level. You must have seen the calculation at the country level already um, done by UNDP before, but this, we take one step further to um, estimate and calculate the, the gender inequality down at the provincial level in, in the country. The second function is to look at the gender and sectoral data sets, which is the underlying cause of gender disparity in any country. And then uh, the third component, is, which is very important to, to me as a, as a data-driven um, person, is that it allows you to download data for your own use. It's not only just to give you the tool to see the data, but you can download it for use. So um, as the map, portrays the current tool covers only a few countries in Southeast Asia. But um, as I said before, this is this concept can be replicated anywhere. Uh, I think um, without going into much detail, I just want to say that now you have seen our just a front page of our gem tool and you heard a little bit about what it can provide. I would like you to start thinking about what it can do for your work. Now, when we talk about the nexus between wash, climate change, and gender, we are now providing you, uh, equip you with data on one leg of the three nexuses. So what, how you can bring this data and combine with the other legs on uh, climate change and wash to uh, utilize the data and use them to make better decisions to address this gender gap in this realm. I would like to invite you to join me in my breakout group discussion and we can go um, a lot deeper in uh, than this four minute that we that I have in, the, in this introduction and then we can uh, discuss further there. Let me turn it back to you, Naomi. Thank you, Pirinan. It's so exciting to see this kind of initiative happening, which is both um, collating data and making it available in a way that it hasn't been before and also exploring new and innovative forms of data collection such that it can be uh, usefully integrated with multiple other data sets for decision making and advocacy and I can see many other uses. Um, look forward to that discussion in your breakout room. Um, and moving on to the final uh, panellists before we move to questions and, and, um, and our further discussion. Um, our fourth speaker is also presenting on a measure-based tool today, and that's Carla Liera from the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, so welcome, Carla. Uh, Carla is a water and sanitation specialist focused on gender and human rights. Uh, she's worked for several years on sanitation and sustainable development initiatives, including uh, undertaking fieldwork and remote management in Africa and Latin America. 
Currently, she's a research associate at SEI and is part of sanitation working groups in Susanna and the Sanitation and Water for All Alliance. Today, joining us from Stockholm at the Centre of Conference Activities, uh, Carla will present the Empowerment in WASH Index, or the IWI, which is a survey-based tool designed to monitor and evaluate gender outcomes of WASH interventions. So Carla, for your brief introduction before we move to questions, I'd like to ask you to share your thoughts on how the IWI can help monitor and evaluate gender outcomes in the context of climate change. Uh, yes, of course. Thank you very much for that introduction, Naomi. Um, and thank you everybody for joining this session, this very important session. And thank you for our uh, speakers for joining me in this session. Um, so first of all, I give you an introduction about the Empowerment Team WASH Index, or in short, the IWI or EWI, however you decide to call it, it's okay. Uh, and then I'll jump to answer your question about climate change and how this tool relates to it. Um, so first of all, let me start to say that the IWI is a survey tool designed to provide missing data on how WASH interventions may contribute to changes in WASH-related gender outcomes. Some of these wash related gender outcomes can be decision making, voice, and control over resources. Um, the index is comprised of indicators to assess empowerment in relation to wash roles and responsibilities at individual, household, and community level. So basically, the index allows us to see, okay, how is how empowered are men and women in the household, but also in a bigger role, for instance, in governance of resources outside of this household and in the society or in the community or in village. Uh, it's all, it can be used in urban and rural context. Um, and of course, the, the tool is uh, quantitative and it can be supported by qualitative data. So you can do interviews besides doing the, the survey. Uh, so data on each indicator is collected using a survey, as I mentioned before, that targets both male and female decision makers in households. Uh, this survey can be, it's developed in Word, but it's usually installed in mWater or Kobo, so it can be used in a mobile device, and it's very easy to use and understand. It has a scale 1 and 2, and then 99 if you get no answer, so it's, uh, it's very qualitative, and we actually have specialists looking at that area of the qualitative aspect of it. Uh, so now back to your question, Naomi. Uh, well, I'll, I'll explain more about the empowerment in WASH index in the in the breakout session, and I'll give an example of Ghana. But to answer your question, Naomi, just uh, in the context of climate change, we want to use the EWI to or the EWI <laughs> to understand how changes in WASH-related outcomes can have an impact on community resilience. So basically, what we want to know here is if more empowered women and men in WASH would have a greater adaptive capacity to climate change. Um, we're still exploring this, and uh, we're exploring how we integrate it into the tool, because as I mentioned, it's very quant uh, quantitative. So we have to be, we have to give wages to each of the questions. So it's not as easy as just inserting a question there. Um, but we'll try to do that later this year by applying the, the survey in Bangladesh with actually one of the, the speakers today, Sabiha. Uh, we'll be trying it out over there. And hopefully by next year in the next World Water Week, we'll be able to present some of the results. Um, thank you very much. And back to you, Naomi. Thanks, Carla. It's really exciting that you'll be trying it out next year in Bangladesh and looking forward to hearing those results. And it's, yeah, it's so important to think about this fascinating question around the connections between empowerment and resilience. And they're some of the issues that Catherine referred to in her framing presentation. And so to, to consider whether empowerment can be a driver of resilience and how we can build resilience through empowerment based approaches is a really critical area of research. So uh, moving on to, to questions for the panel now, and Sandra, I'll ask you to jump in and give us an update on timing and how long we have for the discussion in a minute. But um, what we've heard from the four panelists today is a, a really interesting and complementary mix of different ways of engaging with questions around how to understand uh, gender, wash and climate uh, change links. We've heard about a, a qualitative approach for creating safe spaces to discuss gender-based violence. We talked about a systems mapping approach for looking at intervention points. And then we've heard about two different quantitative approaches to collecting and making use of data to progress uh, gender equality in the context of wash and climate change. And we have a, an initial question for you, Jacob, uh, that's come through in, in the chat box. And, and that is, um, 
from Ankit, who says that the systems visualization approach looks really interesting. And, and what he would like to know is what framework you use to, you to develop the visualizations. I'm not sure if that's referring to the, the software or the, the kind of conceptual framework. So perhaps you can answer both aspects. And also um, Ankit is wondering what the red and blue arrows signify. Uh, thank you very much. The two frameworks, first of all, we had to use uh, PESTEL, where we, we were looking at the political, environmental, ecological, legal, and technological uh, issues in these counties. And then the, the, the DIPSA, where we were looking at uh, the drivers, um, the responses, the impacts. Yeah, so uh, those are the two frameworks that we use to highlight and to see what is happening in the counties. And then with regards to the second question, to the second part of the question, which speaks to the red and blues, uh, where we've used the reds, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. Rather, it means that there is a reduced. So like, for example, if, uh, if, 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 let me, let me use the, the, the first example where we have safe water and sanitation access. So whenever there is safe water uh, and sanitation access, then uh, it reduces the domestic water and sanitation gap. So the gap is no longer as huge as it were. Uh, but if you are to look at it from the, the perspective that this is a bad thing, then you'll see that the red indeed is negating that, that uh, idea. But in this case, the red was to, to show either a decrease or an increase. Yes, I don't know if uh, that, and then for the blue, the blue, the blue shows an increase. So for example, when we have uh, unsafe uh, water storage, it also increases uh, the, the use of uh, unsafe access because what we have in that situation is that uh, there is more polluted sources or uh, the storage is, is at large uh, polluted, then therefore that means that even if, if we have developed it as a point where people are going to, uh, then we see that they are going to unsafe uh, sources. Yes. Thanks, Jacob. That's really helpful. And I think you covered both um, aspects of that question really clearly. And hopefully that's an, enough for you, Ankit, to be able to understand a little bit better. And I um, please do join Jacob's breakout room to, to hear more of the detail about the approach. Um, we have a question for Sabiha now from uh, Cecile. And Cecile is asking, uh, Sabiha, how do you get to reach uh, the women and the people that are involved in your workshops and convince them to participate in the workshop? Um, and then second part to that question is, um, how are you measuring the impact on the communities after the workshops? Um, thank you very much for the for a really nice question. So first of all, we started going to the community. So we have this transit walk as part of the research uh, uh, design. So we went to the communities in the research areas and talked to the people. We also sit in a small um, uh, groups with the females and with the males uh, and discussed uh, several questions around the gender, gender-based violence and wash. So we, um, when we um, found that there were people interested uh, to share their experience. And then we asked, would you like to join in the workshop? Um, yeah, then we can have more detailed discussion about it. And that's how we got the number of participants from there. So tra the transact work uh, was really helpful to start with. Uh, and uh, for the impact in the communities, is that um, at this moment we finished the um, research and we will disseminate it with the LGIs in the local um, at local level and the, with the communities and with CSOs as well, so so that they can take action in their um, upcoming awareness raising and activities. It's also within our Simavis Wash SDG program areas. Therefore, we will also strengthen the work in there, as well as we would also incorporate the research results in future programs so that we can take more action together with. With, uh, different stakeholders uh, at local level. Thank you very much. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Sabiha. And yeah, really great answer. And something that came through from me and what you shared then is the importance of building those long-term relationships and partners with the institutions and the communities that you're engaging with, both to create that space where people are comfortable to participate in the process. And also, so you have those connections in an ongoing way such that you can look towards understanding the impact and, and amplifying the impact that you're able to have. Yeah. yeah. 
So, um, and Cecile said, thanks a lot. <laughs> so um, a question that I have now, um, well, please do keep adding to the, the chat box. We have a few more minutes uh, for the panel questions, but I'd like to ask a question for any of the panelists and perhaps starting with you, Carla, just to reflect a little on uh, some of the challenges involved in working with the tools that you've been working with. So we heard each of you share uh, why you think that they're, they're helpful tools, what you think that they can achieve. And that's a really great start, but I'm sure as with every process, we all experience challenges and it would be really helpful to reflect a little on what some of the challenges have been so far. Um, thank you, Naomi. Uh, yes, of course, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, so some of the challenges that we faced, it's the contextualization of empowerment so how do you actually contextualize empowerment within the community that you're working with? For us, the word empowerment was kind of defined by the research, by literature. So it's very academic related, right? So you need to go to the community and see if it's the same thing that you're understanding within the research that it's being treated in the community. But I think as you discussed, as you and I discussed, or you and the group discussed before, there's also needs to be a consistency in data so you have to be aware that if you change empowerment too much, then you're not gonna be able to have that consistent data. So there's the risk between, you know, contextualization of the word empowerment to make it fit to the local context, but also to make it reflect in a wider space of, of uh, data uh, continuity or consistency, sorry. Um, so that's a big challenge, I think, for the tool. And um, if anybody has, suggestions or has this issue we will happy to discuss them in the breakout session as well um yeah thanks carla and it's such a, a curly question to grapple with um and yeah very very um good good to continue that discussion in the chat group and would any of the other panelists like to share challenges in the approaches that you've taken uh jacob or piranan any piranan maybe we can start with you next any challenges sure. in the work that you've been doing trying to collate and make accessible the very sort of rich and and um and varied data sets that you're working with i think what you have just said was was the challenge that we faced i mean we thought that by collecting a lot of good data would be the end of uh, the solution but it's, it was far from it getting the people, getting the stakeholders to really use this tool was a real challenge. Because I think at the beginning, we thought that we're developing something great, we give it to them, they will use it. It was not the case. So we changed the approach by bringing the stakeholders and users to come on board and start working with us to co-develop the tools. I think similar to the contextualization uh, challenge that Carla had mentioned, but to get them to be part of it, get them to own the process as well, that increased the likelihood of them using it much much more in at the end. So I think that that is the challenge, but it was turned into an opportunity to work with um, the stakeholders. Yeah, thank you. That's yeah, really interesting reflection. And it, it makes me think, I, I believe that there's a face-to-face -face workshop in, at the conference this year, looking at data use um, that WaterAid and SNV and others are, are leading. And um, it's a, a big question for the sector. You know, we have a lot of data where we're working on building um, better and richer data sets all the time, but a really key part of that step in, in, is making sure that it's actually useful to inform the, the work that we do and the decisions that are made. So I think our, our time for questions is up. So what I will do now is thank uh, each of the panelists for your really engaging presentations and fantastic responses to questions and hand over to Sandra to set up the breakout groups and looking forward to the breakout discussions and then uh, final coming back to hear reflections at the end. Thank you, Naomi. And thank you for all the panelists for this uh, yeah, wonderful discussion. And I think it's just like a first yeah, pitch or a first uh, introduction to the different tools and there's lots more to discuss. So uh, please do stay for the breakout rooms uh, and it's a very good opportunity to discuss uh, yeah, directly with the panelists and to get more information on, on, you know, on those different tools and how you maybe can use them in your own work. Um, so we have five breakout rooms for you and you are able to choose the one you want to, yeah, you're more, most interested in. Um, so we have four rooms linked to the four panelists. Uh, so the first one is around the gender and worst research tool, but will be facilitated by Sabia and Emma. 
and why should you join this room? Yeah, to learn more about doing inclusive research and how to create a safe space. I think Sabia already touched on this. So yeah, if you want to learn more about that, please join room one. In room two, we'll be about assisting mapping in Kenya, uh, and they will be sharing experience from Kajado uh, County. So Jacob will be there uh, together with units from CESPET. So why do you join this one? To understand how the causal loop diagram can be used to identify key entry points for men, women and girls' meaningful participation in Washington climate change decision making. So if you want to know more about the system mapping, please uh, join room two. Room three is about the gender equality monitoring tool, tool with a GEM tool, where uh, Peranam, together with his colleague Prakriti, will be uh, joining. Why should you go there? To get oriented onto the tool that visualizes gender gaps at subnational level and also contribute to its development. So if you want to know more, please join that room. In room four, we'll be focused on the empowerment in WASH index. Uh, and as Carla already mentioned, she will share some findings from Ghana. Uh, so Carla will be there. Uh, so please join if you want to partner up to generate gender data and evidence in your region. Uh, and we have another room for you uh, to discuss the policy implications and needs to, to integrating gender washing climate change. So Catherine will be there. Uh, and why should you join this one? This is a chance to share your thoughts and experience around gender, climate, and WASH. Um, so I will open the breakout rooms and you will uh, be able to, uh, to choose one. So in your uh, Zoom toolbox, you'll be able to see uh, the breakout room pop up, I hope. And there you can click on and you can choose one of the rooms. So I think I already see some people moving. So please go to your breakout room option and, and click which one you want to go to. And if any issues, please let me know. There's still some people unassigned. For the ones who are still here, I see room number five is very small. So if you want to go there, feel very welcome. Welcome back. I see some of you are already coming back. Let's wait a few seconds for everyone to come back in the main room. I hope you had a fruitful discussion. Yes. Good to hear that. And we still have a few seconds for people to come back here. Okay. Welcome back everyone to the main room again. Uh, I hope you had a good discussion in the smaller groups. Um, yeah, as you only were in one group, we also want to do a round uh, and see what are the main highlights of the different groups. So first of all, I want to give the floor to Emma to give a one minute recap of group one. Yeah, sure, happy to. We had a very nice intimate uh, break breakout room and we were really able to go into details. That was really nice. Uh, we also had someone there who was actually working on their own research in Nepal also about like the nexus um, with GBV. So that was interesting. Uh, so we mostly talked about, you know, how Sabia and the team set up the research from start to finish. Um, what are the things that you think about before setting that up? What are some of the challenges that you encounter? 
Um, so we talked about, you know, the different methods that were applied, such as a transact walk, the key informant interviews, how to then also involve government officials, and then uh, the workshop and the focus group discussions. Um, we also shortly touched upon, you know, which activities um, did go really well and also really prompted people to really open up about these issues. And then Sabiha came up with the example of role play which is like a very fun method for people to yeah, bring everyone together uh, to involve people and have them uh, in different roles, uh, basically creating a scene about a certain wash situation and see how everyone responds to that. So that was also something that was shared. Um, and then at the end, uh, Sabiha shared some uh, great tips about, uh, you know, how to deal with consultants, the importance of having a good facilitator there with uh, a good expertise on gender. Um, so that was sort of in a nutshell, the things that we was, we discussed, and it was a really nice, uh, yeah, it was a really nice discussion, actually. So uh, it was great. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Sounds very interesting indeed. Uh, so let's hear from Jacob to hear how room two discussed. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, for our room, we went into the details of uh, the casual loop diagram and uh, two, two interesting questions came up. Uh, one was on the how, uh, in terms of when, when, uh, when do we engage? And we went into the details of uh, the planning process, which calls upon uh, uh, going through the budgeting process and when the develop the the planning documents are developed and why it is important to engage in the development of these uh, uh, planning documents uh, starting from the five year to the annual one and when specifically can you influence so um, the other question was on uh, why the choice of the two frameworks uh, that is the pastel and um, and the DIPSA, uh, which uh, we highlighted that, uh, first of all, uh, the, the Nexus wash gender climate is a complex uh, Nexus, and also it touches on different aspects of the two frameworks. And so uh, there was need for us to contextualize uh, the, the, uh, the wash system in that, with that regard. And uh, having said that, we also identified um, some of the challenges uh, that are uh, that are hindering uh, meaningful participation, uh, which was done through a context analysis, and among them was how information is shared uh, to women, uh, the distance uh, through which they have to travel if they have to to participate. But most importantly, we highlighted the need to to be networked, uh, which was also undertaken through a social network analysis. Yes, Thanks, so it was quite compact. Yeah, thank you. Mm. I think you had the biggest group, so I think a uh, lot of interest for, for your tool. <laughs> so let's move to room three, uh, Prakriti, take it away. Okay, uh, so we discussed a bit of technical aspects of the tool and what are the possibilities in terms of data visualization from the tool. We also got one good feedback on how to make this tool applicable across uh, sectors. But the key takeaways largely from our experience in putting the tool into practice were that, you know, policymakers are looking for such tools, including, uh, you know, the GEM tool for, for making more informed poli uh, policy planning decisions so that they can prioritize their interventions. Uh, but then these tools, more importantly, they should not have just the ma macro view, like taking the data from the national levels, but also, you know, have some components of uh, informing from, you know, in, in the bottom up way. So that local level engagement also in designing these tools is, is very critical. So that's quickly our two key takeaways from, uh, from largely implementing the tool. Back to you, Sandra. Thanks a lot. Very nice summary. Uh, let's move to room four. Uh, Carla, can you give a short update what you discussed? Uh, yes. So we presented the tool a bit further on, and then we talked about the case study in Ghana. And it was nice because um, uh, one of the participants was working in Zimbabwe on rain rainwater harvesting. She was interested about using the tool in her project, research project, and just kind of realized like, okay, I'm not paying enough attention to gender and I should. And it, we think it's a perfect timing for that. So uh, we'll be keeping in touch with, with her. And then another question was about uh, 
um, so participants being overwhelmed with too many questions, if you're already applying other surveys, other questionnaires, if you're doing qualitative, quantitative work, this tool can be a bit too heavy for them. So what we said is that also um, wash questions at the beginning that they're needed actually. So it can co help contextualize like what's the wash situation in the community and it doesn't need to be separated into many questionnaires. It can be one and then you can facilitate, you know, um, stakeholder overwhelming. I don't know the correct term, but you, I think you understand. So that's basically what we discussed in our group study. Yeah, thank you, Carla. I think indeed this survey fatigue is, is yeah, something to take into account. <laughs> yeah, how do you balance, like, what is neat to know, what is nice to know, and, and how do you balance that? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, lastly, Catherine, how was your group discussion? It was really good. Um, so we were we were the kind of catch-all group um, to share experiences and really look at policy and not focus on a particular tool, um, which meant that our conversation went everywhere. So sort of four big takeaways. One, um, a real focus on transformative approaches um, and really thinking about it in that way and making sure we're not putting the burden on the women who need access the most to, to be the ones to fix the problem. Um, talking about multi-identities and um, so sort of the intersectionality of different identities and not treating women, girls, or men as a single group. Um, talking about the impacts of policies that are external to WASH but then impact WASH. Um, and then fourth, um, sort of how do we communicate these messages um, to get people interested in making the right kind of policies and how we need to think about the audiences and shift the message depending on the audience and changing the level of detail depending on the audience. Um, so we were very grateful to have a comms member in our, in our team to give us some advice on that. Uh, so back to you, Sandra. Sounds great. Yeah, and that uh, brings us to the end of today's session. And I would like to thank everyone for sharing your reflections and also for joining the breakout rooms and you have a discussion with us. Um, I would especially like to thank the presenters and the, and the panel members. So Catherine, Naomi, Sabia, Jacob, Perenan, and Carla. And of course, all the other people who have support on the background uh, to make this session a success. And I think, yeah, from today's session, we have seen that, you know, well, women are disproportionately affected by climate change. They are also uniquely situated to lead efforts in the response. Uh, and it's a very important and very urgent journey. I think we can all see the impacts of climate change uh, in our own countries. So we really should uh, think as a sector, take it on. And there are yeah, different tools and research results presented today, I think are a step, step towards stepping into the potential of women in this nexus. Uh, so I really hope that the session has helped you to, to inspire you and to know which tools are out there. And please reach out to us in case you want to know more. Uh, so we really can, yeah, not reinvent the wheel, but yeah, build on what is there um, and, and really make sure that we, we tackle this, this, this challenge together. And we have a very big and important battle to take up. So achieving worse is yeah, even SG6 in 2030 is I think still we're, yeah, we're behind. So we should make a big effort to make it happen. Um, and let's not think we all know the answers, but let's keep on learning from each other and in a way that we can improve uh, step by step. And once again, thank you so much for participating. And if you want to stay in touch, I will put my email address in the, in the chat box on Petable. So feel free to reach out and I can link you to the different organizations that are uh, supporting in this um, session. And if you want to know more about the, the different tools, happy to link you up. And um, yeah, I want to wish you a very great World Water Week this week and next week. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very Thanks much, everyone. everyone. Thanks, Have a everyone. good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.